Actually, Steve, I am going to talk about that nudge theory. <laughs> uh, when Andrew sent the email, however, suggesting that I talk about the use of rubrics in the Graduate School of Management taught master's program, I didn't feel that I had a choice. <laughs> uh, so, but Andrew has followed this uh, nudge theory with other lecturers in the department and he encouraged me to do the same. So my brief was to ensure that the GSM Master's Programme assessments were both compliant with policy and good practice, which you would hope would be the same thing. So what I'm going to talk about today is my experience as a learning designer, exploring ways to meet the policy, adhere to the requirements of the upcoming accreditation, and to follow the brief of implementing a broader use of rubrics across the GSM Master's. I'll talk a little bit about the types of rubrics, and I doubt that there will be time, but I do have a couple of slides with some tips and some of the latest research, which you can read at your leisure, should you be suffering from insomnia at some point. I'm sure you've all had this experience of marking or grading, and I'll read it. I'm not sure if everyone can see it up the back there. Problem one, total points, 10. Got correct answer, 10 points. Yay. Used correct formula but made a math error. Eight points. Sort of knew what to do but used the wrong formula. Six points. Oh, so close. Obviously had no clue but gave it the old college try. Two points. Hmm. Left it blank. Do you even care? Complete nonsense. Minus 10 points. Are you even in the class? Probably this is one of the students who would receive a message from uh, ONTAS. Forgot to put their name on the test, minus 100 points, and you're in college. And then, my favourite, spelling grammar error, not on my watch. So to save us from a ritual burning of assessments by academics, let's look at my topic. The use and abuse of rubrics in the GSM Master's Programme. But to be honest, luckily I have my own office with a door shut and the abuse mainly comes from me trying to figure out the criteria and the grading for the rubric that has been sent to me. So let's look at what the issue was. And why. So a little over a year ago when I was appointed, my brief was to increase the use of rubrics in the program. I'd had some prior experience in undergrad teaching communication and in upskilling teachers at postgrad level, but I'd used Blackboard and wasn't familiar with Canvas. When I came here, of course, I discovered that inputting a rubric into Canvas is just as complex as it was and convoluted um, as it was in Blackboard. However, still useful. So what did I want to do? I wanted to do my job and assist academic staff with the rigours of completing assessment marking in a taught master's programme which is run over several quarters of 10 weeks. Moreover, I wanted to assist in the assessment design process so that students got helpful feedback and feed forward. And I wanted them, the students as well as the staff, to be aware of at least, if not thinking about, how to embed and how to be aware of the graduate profile and the associated learning outcomes with each of the assessments. So some more detail later about how this connects to the policy. I'll talk a little bit about my results, which are anecdotal. And as I said, probably the tips will be in your own time. A more diverse student population has led to calls across the globe for more diverse assessment, different student-centred approaches to learning, which take into account the co-construction of learning and teaching. So everybody knows that we are moving from dialogic, uh, didactic rather, to a constructivist approach. 
the upcoming audit or the assurance of learning was certainly a factor in my um, preparation. And lastly, I really wanted students to do well in their assessment and have the best chance. And also, I really liked my job, so I wanted to keep it. Like Steve, I went straight for a definition. A well-designed rubric is an effective communication tool. It emphasises the important skills or concepts to demonstrate. It provides criteria for evaluation. And the reason I chose this particular quote and the reason I like it is because it looks at the two sides of the assessment coin, and that is learners and evaluators or assessors. So what did I do? In the normal process of my role as a learning designer is to review assessments for all of the courses in the GSM. So as I went through the normal process, I looked at those assessments which had a rubric attached and those who didn't. Most actually did, but to different degrees. I offered to assist with rubric design for the assessments that didn't have a rubric. And often this involved a meeting with a lecturer or me sending them a draft that I thought could be useful. Sometimes the answer was negative, no thanks, you know, don't need that. Other times it was positive. Sometimes there was even surprise. In some cases, I offered to put the rubric into Canvas to help people who wanted to use the rubric in speed grader. Naturally, those lecturers were appreciative. Well, the times that it worked anyway, but two out of three ain't bad. Sometimes I'd get a Canvas alert where someone had sent a message to the student saying, I've uploaded the assessment, which is an essay, rubric to come. Cue me in. There I would send off a rubric or phone the person, pop up to the office and say, I see that you're going to uh, assess your essay shortly. Would you like me to help out with a rubric? After a short time, I was able to draw on other rubrics that were being used across the GSM and sometimes I could copy from one course to another. So occasionally I could take a rubric from a marketing course and put it into um, an accounting course, for example. Sometimes I just used one bit of the rubric that was relevant for that person. But it was a very helpful way for me to understand the demands of the assessments by engaging with the lecturers and having a conversation around <coughs> their course and their requirements. Before I was appointed, two intrepid souls in the GSM set up a community of practice and they ran workshops and set up a Canvas site as well. So once I'd gauged enough interest, I was able to set up a module in Canvas and upload many of the rubrics that were already in the department, thanks to the previous learning designer. I'd like to talk briefly about the connection of my topic to the assessment, the nine principles of the assessment, particularly the student-centred ones. So these are the ones that I think connect to the use of rubrics. Number three, assessment tasks are demonstrably aligned with course learning level outcomes and program and university level graduate profiles. Having said that, I could probably argue a case for the use of rubrics for all of these, but I only have 17 minutes and lunchtime approaches. In my conversations with academics, one of the key things that I always focused on was the alignment between course learning outcomes and the rubric. In fact, some of the people I've worked with would probably describe me as mildly obsessive about this, and I'm happy to wear that label because it means I'm doing my job properly. More recently, I have started adding the relevant parts of the graduate attributes into the rubrics and into the assessments. Principle number five I'll talk about next. I did consider four, but we ran, we're going to run out of time. So if the rubrics are distributed to students along with the assessment task, then I would consider that the assessment task is transparent. And as far as consistency goes, we are starting to use similar rubrics for similar types of assessments. Sometimes, as I said, just one part of the rubric may be used across the GSM. Principle six, feedback. Feedback is timely and provides meaningful guidance to support independent learning. I'll discuss later, in the case of an analytic rubric, 
not only do students receive feedback, but in an analytic rubric, they're more likely to receive feed forward. However, of course, the use of a rubric doesn't guarantee that the students will receive feedback in a timely manner. That's up to the lecturer and their workload. Nor does it guarantee that the students will use the feedback. And there's a body of research at the moment on feedback literacy addressing this problem. But that's another whole session. What I'd like to talk about briefly are the disadvantages now and the advantages of using rubrics. One of the advantages is that it can contribute to a consistency of marking. Notice I've used the word can because it depends on how robust your moderation process is and how those criteria are interpreted. One of the other advantages is that the students can save time by reducing the number, the lecturers rather, can save time by the number of comments that they have to write. It can help students know what's expected of them and it can help students to become more self-regulated learners, thus make a more critical analysis of their progress. But one of the most important things for me is it can contribute to feed forward. The disadvantages, it takes a long time. Some people argue that we spend so much time and put so much detail into the rubrics that actually it causes greater levels of anxiety for students. Torrance even went so far as to say that actually what the rubric does is to encourage instrumental learning. The students just focus on how to get through the assessment and actually not whether they've learned anything or not. There are a couple of answers to this. Use a dialogic approach with students and get students to mark work using the rubric. Hold on a minute, you say we've got enough trouble getting through the content. I use, and students are just, all students worry about, that's what I hear quite a lot, and I know I had the same experience, all they worry about is the assessment and what grade they're going to get. So in the past I've used this to my experience, to my advantage. So I presented the problem to the students. We have two hours today. I can spend two hours going over the content that's going to be in the test or the assignment, or I can explain the assessment to you and go through the rubric. Generally, they would say yes. So what I would do was to get them to use the rubric. And we used it successfully recently with one of the lecturers in the professional development course, where she completed the assessment, which was a short speaking assessment of two or three minutes, and we managed to get all the students to mark her. Once they had got over the fear of marking their lecturer, and would there be any consequences, they actually started to enjoy the process and engage with it. And we had what we call the ah oh effect, which is students figuring it out. My favourite, breakfast in bed. Some of you may have seen from the um, recent news that I got married recently. So this was the rubric I applied to my fiancé before I tied the knot. I have to say there's still room for improvement. It's not here. Um, so this rubric is probably very similar to the grade or grading uh, sheet that a lot of you people use already. The advantage is it's quick. Disadvantage, you have to fill in the gaps on either side. Breakfast in bed holistic rubric. Once again, advantage, it's quick. Disadvantage, there's no feed forward for students. The analytic favourite is my favourite, and as one of my students called me picky and pedantic once, which I took as a compliment, naturally I favour these. And I think Nabil was going to ask this question of uh, Deirdre later, earlier, and, it, and I'm going to answer it now. So which is the best? It depends. So what I try and do when I'm working with lecturers is figure out what kind of rubric suits them, their marking style, the amount of time they have, and the assessment. And then we choose from analytic, holistic, or the single grade one. The advantages, lots of detail, lots of feed forward. Disadvantages, takes a lot of time to write. 
In the interests of transparency as well and to meet our um, outside expectations, I started adding the graduate profile and the learning outcomes <coughs> to some of the rubric parts. And the reason for this is to get students engaged and, lecture, and remind lecturers as well. Because a lot of the, um, in my experience anyway, of external audits, in a lot of cases students don't even know what a learning outcome is because they don't read the course outline. So they read the assessment though, so now I'm putting it on top of the assessment as well. So what were some of the results? I only have anecdotal evidence. Some of the students found a reported, and a very small number, so we have the students from the SECC meetings, report back that they found the use of rubrics helpful. Some staff emailed and said, yep, yeah, Una, it was helpful. I even had one fellow who came to my office and stood in the doorway and said, hey, Una, that rubric you gave me was really helpful. When I started to laugh, he apologised. He said, I didn't mean to sound so surprised. <laughs> so that was, that's some evidence of using the nudge theory, if you like. The other advantage we had in that theory was with the approach, or with changes in timetable, we had people who were very experienced in using rubrics in Canvas, working with people who hadn't used them at all. So they were able to spread the word, if you like, talk to each other. So, thank you for listening today. Do you have any questions? Yes? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that it was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I learned a lot from that, and it's so great that the business school has you to help them with the creation of their rubrics. Um, that's awesome. Thank you very much. I knew I should have given one out. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> um, you said that it, um, choosing the right rubric depends. Um, do, you, do you think uh, analytic rubrics might be better for larger classes with the, the more rubric detail? Probably could be actually. I have a bias towards them. Um, we, we have relatively, as you know, small classes in the GSM. So I, I don't know if, it, if it's transferred, but they may well be. And, and there, is, there is research on that. There's also some research on how the use of those analytic rubrics can reduce the number of grade queries. So it may be useful for that. Yeah. Because it seems like a really good way to <coughs> save time on writing lots and lots and lots of feedback if a lot of it's already covered. Um, yeah, if you can just highlight or circle or you can, you know, you do what um, Deidre did with the snagit. Mm. So we're, in, the, the other thing I didn't mention is we're encouraging people to use them in Canvas because then we can pull the analytics out to help us map to the um, assurance of learning. Mm. That was another nudge from Andrew. Any other questions? Well, I'm comfortable oh. in the first church. Yeah. Uh, between the level eight course, level nine course, and how that's reflected. Yeah, I try to. So you've really got to make sure, that, so the question was, do I make a distinction between a level eight and a level nine course, which is an ongoing discussion we, we have. Um, I try to, but really that comes back in a way to the demands of the assessment, but you do have to make sure that they are mapped. So for example, sometimes it'll be to do with the allocation of marks, if you're mark, yeah. so the heavier, more critical thinking, part of the rubric will have a greater allocation of marks, say, than referencing or something like that, which you take kind of for granted. Yeah. So you've got to get the weighting right, otherwise, as someone mentioned earlier, you have all your students getting an A, and then you've got to explain that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.